to be talking with Professor Jennifer Rexford from Princeton University. Very briefly, Jen joined Princeton in February 2005 after spending about eight and a half years at at and Research. Her research has focused a lot on internet routing, network measurement, and network management. Uh, she's also the co-author of Web Protocols in Practice, a widely read and loved book on HTTP. And most recently, she's been very, very active in the SDN area in the development of something called Frenetic, which we'll talk about today. It's a, it's a programming language for SDNs. Um, and on top of that, I should say she's an all-around great mentor. Uh, she was a surrogate uh, co-advisor for, for me way back in the day when we were working on network management problems. So uh, welcome, Jen, and uh, thanks for spending the time with, with us. My pleasure. So uh, I wanted to, to start with, uh, with some history, actually. I, I know that, that uh, you've got a really long history working on network management problems, uh, back, dating back to your days working on the at t Backbone Network. And I was wondering, what were some of the more challenging network management problems you faced then? And uh, do you think that if you had SDN back then, some of those problems would have been easier? Yeah, great question. So it, the Internet really wasn't designed with network management in mind. I mean, it was designed with many good things in mind about lowering the barrier for creating new applications and doing experimentation. But network management really was an afterthought in the in the early design of the Internet. That was driven home to me the most. And in, uh, a few years after I went to AT&T, one of the people who designed the routing algorithms for AT&T's long-distance network asked me to give him an overview of how the Internet works. And I started walking him through all the different protocols and how they interact with one another. And he was getting very impatient. And he finally said, no, look, if I tell you what the offered load in the network is, how will the routing adapt to give good performance? And I said, well, we don't know the offered load. The routing protocols don't adapt automatically to the traffic, and we're not really sure how to tune them to do so ourselves. But other than that, we've got it under control. And uh, and so for many years oh, at AT&T, over three iPad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We try. So over over a number of years at AT&T, a group of us worked on well. Let's collect measurement data so that we can infer what the offered load on the network is. Let's model the protocols so that we can tune them to do what we want them to do. And everything was always indirect. We're trying to take limited measurements from various points of the network and infer the thing we actually wanted to know. We would try to model if we twist this knob in some protocol that our boxes had. Uh, what would happen to the traffic, and we would take our inferred traffic and our models of what the control plane would do, and then we would try on top of that to slap on some sort of optimization so that we would be tuning the network to do our bidding. And in the end, we were reinventing what the boxes themselves were doing. And in fact, worse than that, we were having to invert what the boxes were doing to coax the network into doing what we wanted, even though what we wanted to do was often very simple, like minimize the most congested link in the network or put a bound on propagation delay for video traffic. And so I think the most difficult thing was, was the indirectness of what we were trying to do. And the very, very fat uh, interface that we had to the underlying configuration languages to the routers, these very low-level assembly language-like interfaces that we would have to model to be able to have tools on top. So I think that SDN would be helpful, uh, would have been helpful then, because it, it would have had a much thinner interface to the underlying hardware and a much more direct interface and a much more network-wide visibility and control for influencing the underlying traffic. So for me, that's the thing that's exciting about SDN is it's a way to have network-wide visibility and control and direct control instead of having to spend all of your energy working backwards to try to force the network to do what you want it to do. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, the, the directness of, of, of having an SDN controller pretty much make it so rather than having to to sort of infer indirectly what the what the what the configuration is doing that that definitely makes a lot of sense um, I guess I wanted to, to sort of jump right in and start talking about um, programming abstractions a little bit mm -hmm. because um, one of the things that uh, that I guess one of the promises that SDN holds is the ability to kind of program the network and r rather than sort of indirectly you know, infer what's going on from configuration. Right. So um, I guess that, that kind of, you know, there's a huge promise there, but it really begs the question of what are the right programming abstractions for SDN. So, so have you thought about that question, and, and what, what, types of, what types of abstractions do you think are good ones? 
Right. So if you look at the early uh, first generation of SDN controllers, they provided an API to programmers that closely mimicked the API they had to the underlying switches. The so-called northbound API, if you will, to programmers was largely the same as the southbound API to the underlying network equipment. And that's natural because you have to start somewhere and um, figuring out the right abstractions to build, you have to have something to start from. But that makes it possible to program the network, but it doesn't make it easy. And the reason it makes it hard is it forces the programmer to think about individual rules, the priorities of those rules, the patterns that might overlap between those rules. And if you have multiple pieces of logic that in your application that need to interact with one another, you have to make sure they don't step on each other, that one rule doesn't override another, that they don't one rule causes packets to go one way and another application wanted to see those packets at the controller and they're not there anymore. So all of that sort of um, fine-grained resource allocation and contention resolution is something the programmer has to do himself. Um, so that that's a big problem. And then you have the additional problem that you're really, even though the controller is centralized, you still have a distributed system. You have a distributed collection of switches and you have to reason about both how to partition work between the switches and the controller and how to update distributed collections of switches in a way that they behave as one. And so to me, the, the key abstractions are to help the programmer deal with, the, with all of those difficulties. So if you think of network management as a control loop, you're monitoring the network to know the topology and the traffic and the, the network conditions. You're changing your policy of how you want that traffic to be handled based on that information. And then finally, you're updating the distributed collection of switches to implement that policy. And so what we've tried to do in this Frenetic project, which is a joint project between Princeton and Cornell, and between programming languages researchers who think about these abstractions and networking researchers who know what the sort of domain specific details are, we're trying to have abstractions for each of those three phases, monitoring or reading network state, uh, writing uh, network state, and in the middle deciding how to update a policy um, based on how conditions have changed. And so that's what we're trying to do in Frenetic is have abstractions for each of those three with a real emphasis on composition so that you can combine application modules that do different tasks together uh, without having to write one big piece of spaghetti code. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you've reached the right level of abstraction? I mean, it seems like, you know, even looking at things like uh, things that preceded frenetic, like FML, as you said, they were pretty low level. Mm -hmm. you, you know, even by some token, some might say frenetic is is still a little bit low level in the sense that it that it operates on on you know uh, packets and flows as opposed to sort of you know really high level policy. Do you see? that there are more abstractions coming or, or, or do you, how do you know when, when we've got the right abstractions? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think Frenetic is the entire answer. I think in some ways the Frenetic project, we've been pretty bottom up. We started with writing a bunch of applications on existing controller platforms, experiencing pain and addressing the pain as we go along. So it's, right. it's very pragmatic in that sense, even though we're, we're working with some, we're working really hard to get the abstractions just right and trying to bring in people that have programming language expertise who can exercise good taste and judgment on how to find simple orthogonal abstractions that can work well together. But we are doing it in this very pragmatic bottom-up way. So it's true that we've raised a level of abstraction, but I think a lot of people would like it to be much more abstract. Create a VPN, stitch together these middle boxes. These are, you know, these are the kinds of things you might do on a level on top of frenetic, but frenetic is still relatively close to reasoning about packet forwarding logic. And so it's still still lower than that. But we think if we get those foundations right, it'll be a lot easier to build the next layer of things on top. So I would say we're unabashedly bottom up in, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. pragmatic in thinking about which part of the problem to attack. And we figure the things that will come on top will be better enabled by having a richer infrastructure below. So think we're going from assembly language, you know, to C or to, or to some equivalent of C, but not necessarily all the way up to an Eclipse framework or Java, you know, just to, to finish the, the analogy. Got it, yeah. No, that, that makes really good sense to kind of chase the, chase the problems and then see where the, where the pain points are. Yeah, um, and how to know when you're done, I think that's a really tricky question because in a lot of research, particularly in networking, we tend yeah. to focus on resource allocation questions, and so it's very easy to quantify. My solution runs at this speed, this many packets per second. I can route this packet in this much time. I can work with this small a table. You know, the resource allocation questions naturally lend themselves to quantitative evaluation, mm -hmm. and evaluating a programming language is a little bit like looking at art and saying, oh, you know, there's nothing else this artist could have taken away in making this sculpture. You know, so it's very difficult to look at a programming language and say, yeah, this is right. But we can look at a language and say, well, these abstractions are orthogonal, that there are a few simple ideas that we can use in many different ways to do many different things, then, then that's at least a sign of a good design. And if we can take an application that was painful to write in, a, in one of the existing earlier controller platforms and then show how much easier it is to write, 
with frenetic, that's good. And if we can show that the abstractions aren't so up in the stratosphere that it's impossible to compile them in a way automatically that they run efficiently on the underlying hardware, then we've demonstrated that we've raised the level of abstraction in some sort of sweet spot where it becomes a lot easier to express yourself, but not, not so easy to write programs that really stink in terms of uh, their underlying performance without realizing it. And so I think that's, the, that's the, the delicate balance we have to strike. And that's why we've been pretty bottom-up, because if we get too far away from what the underlying hardware can do, we might be able to let people express really rich ideas that we can never compile to run efficiently on existing, existing switches. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, now what about um, people, do you imagine that people might use Frenetic to, to sort of write things on, you know, at a higher level of abstraction? So even if you're not the one developing the abstraction, maybe there are others who are, who are basically using the language to, you know, deploy apps, if you will, or something like mm -hmm. that, that would, that would, uh, you know, perform higher level functions. Definitely. And when I talk to companies about Frenetic, that's a way they, they think about using it, is that they might have a network management tool that today spits out something that talks to the command line interface of a router. And they might think, well, maybe our network management tool should spit out the kind of output Frenetic programs would spit out. And we can take advantage of the way Frenetic supports composition, where multiple modules can be written independently. And so those modules might not even be written, in, they might be written in some different language, but they, the way we integrate the modules together might be using some of the composition operators that exist in Frenetic. So the Frenetic becomes a sort of glue language, uh, but, but you might still be configuring the network using something more domain specific. So if you're doing traffic management, Maybe the language of optimization is the right way to think about it. I want to minimize congestion on my links. And if you're doing access control, maybe a reachability matrix is your representation. But when you want to combine those things together, you might say, OK, I want to write this using the sort of underlying language we have in Frenetic called NetCore, which gives you a way to specify packet processing policies and to compose them together. And so that glue, that glue language might be a way to take things that are written in, in different, more domain-specific languages on top and combine them together. Uh, that's th yeah. That seems super useful. Um, I guess um, that I guess on, on a related note, um, who do you who do you envision as the as the the programmers of Frenetic, if you will? I mean, uh, the interesting thing about SDN is it kind of uh, it seems to be uh, creating a shotgun marriage of sorts of network operators and software developers. Um, you've got operators who haven't really programmed and developers who maybe don't know everything about network operations and problems there that they should. So right. I'm wondering, who do you see as the, as the programmers? Yeah, I think that's a huge question for the field in general, not just for Frenetic. I think if you look at the early successes in SDN, like Google's deployment in their wide area backbone, or Nasira's network virtualization platform, those are really, really successful platforms solving real important problems. But they're definitely point solutions. They're not trying to create a broad platform that separates the platform developer from the, from the application developer, right? Google has a whole army of people building switches, controller platforms, and apps all integrated. And likewise, Nasira sells you a, a single solution. I think that's natural for the first generation of, of successful tech transfers of, of, of SDN. But I think we, the ultimate success is if we create uh, something like a, a platform like Unix or Linux has been, where a lot, or lots of people can write applications and you can pick and choose code written by other people to combine it together to do something bigger than you would have been able to do alone. And so for that, I think there are at least two kinds of programmers. Mm -hmm. People writing these individual modules, uh, these third-party apps, if you will, and people that decide to combine them together to solve a particular problem in their own domain. And so the network operators might not be writing the raw applications from scratch, but they might be, instead of typing command line interface on the router might still be saying, well, I want a module that does a firewall and a module that does server load balancing and a module that does monitoring, and I want them to be, th this traffic to go through one and this traffic to go through the other and in this order, snapping those pieces together, doing some sort of modest programming that might be uh, configuring how the pieces snap together, writing the main routine of the program, if you will, but not all the functions. That, that's a really uh, interesting analogy. I, haven't, I hadn't heard the, the Linux uh, distribution analogy before. It's almost like I can imagine a, you know, app get, like package manager or something like this, where an operator was pulling different packages, and then your package manager was managing dependencies and making sure that, you know, various modules did, didn't conflict or, you know, were up to date and so forth. So, exactly. Um, I mean, and you think about the Unix analogy, I mean, a lot of people program just by using pipe. Right. right. It's Absolutely. a beautiful abstraction. Yeah. You know, I/O redirection and piping are, are beautiful, right? I mean that you can snap lots of different applications together, and you don't even have to write code. You're sort of writing code in a way, 
but you're writing code in the sense that you're figuring out the right combination of existing little routines that each do one thing that you stitch together and in what way. Yeah, that's that's outstanding. Um, that's really interesting. Um, so actually, you know, building on this this packet management or package management kind of analogy, um, mm -hmm. you know, I guess probably there, you know, anyone who's who's messed with certain package managers have have experienced the frustration of you know, not being able to install something because of a circular dependency or, or whatnot. And um, I guess my next question is, um, you know, at the be beginning of the, you know, of our, of our chat here, we talked about how tough it was for operators to be dealing with, you know, all these little bits and pieces that were independent. But it seems like SDN has its own set of, of challenges because, you know, if we take the package management uh, analogy, you know, Th that can break too, right? And it seems right. like the you know the the ways that we reason about dependencies in SDN, um, you know, it. I guess the question is, is it is it any better? <laughs> right, right. I think so. I think there's the, the first way that SDN is better, and it's already true, is is not having to have a device driver for every kind of command line interface. I've talked to companies in the in Silicon Valley that mm -hmm. do enterprise network management, and they have armies of hundreds of people who just write device drivers to say, okay, here's a Juniper box, here's a Cisco box, here's an F5 box, just so they can have one unified way of doing configuration, but still speak to the vast majority of devices that have completely di either completely different configuration interfaces or worse yet seemingly similar configuration interfaces with different combinations of default parameters and options and so on. So I think uh, SDN already basically says I want that to be open and that helps a lot even if you don't go any further. And then I think if you have some yeah. higher level abstractions like we have currently in the Frenetic project, you go one level further of at least being able to write modular code to be able to work in a higher level language rather than assembly language. But dealing with dependencies, I think, is, is a tricky question. I think there, there are two kinds of dependencies. One is, you know, my code depends on its running on your code, which I think when you do a sort of an app get, I want to install, you know, one piece of code and I can't even do it because it depends on a library. And right. the other, which is, I think, more what we're trying to do in Frenetic, is that these two modules need to affect the handling of the exact same packet that I want not only to have a firewall that might drop some packets, but the ones that don't get dropped, I want them to be routed. So I don't want a firewall, run the firewall on some of my traffic and the routing on the other. I need to be able to specify that they, they each partially say what I want to do, but I still want to write them independently. And that's the kind of thing, at least in Frenetic, we focused on, which is to let the modules be written independently, but to let the programmer say, well, I want them to run in parallel, as if they each have their own copy of the packet, like the guy that's doing monitoring can monitor traffic while the guy that's doing routing can forward, and they run in parallel, or that they run in series, that I have a server load balancing module that says which copy of the website this traffic is going to go to, and a second module that routes the traffic there once that choice has been made, running those two modules in series. And so we're giving the programmer a way to say, hey, this is the way I want to reconcile the ordering constraints on these two modules so that there isn't a, a circularity issue. And because there, that's mm -hmm. not something we can guess, right? We can't guess what, what order the programmer is right. going to want. So we need to give them tools to specify how to snap, which traffic should go through which boxes and in what order. And then in the end, we want it to all come down to a single set of rules in each switch. Yeah. And that's the, the secret sauce underneath for us, is to let the programmer think those modules are independent, even though in the end, we need to have one rule or one set of rules in, in each switch that's going to say what to do. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it definitely seems like you know, uh, specifying those kind of priorities and, and dependencies isn't likely something that today's network operators are probably used to doing. And I wonder if that means, like, there's going to be, you know, uh, an emergence of a, of a new kind of network operator, if you will, uh, someone mm -hmm. who, you know, peddles these kinds of packages to, to, to people who actually run the network. Yeah, I think there'll be, a, I mean, the success here would mean that we have a, a, a rich community of third-party software developers that develop modules and that network operators at a minimum are adept at knowing which modules to use and how to snap them together. And, and ones that are even more adept or have a, a more custom need in their own environment might write their own module. But they wouldn't have to write everything from scratch. It's almost like the, the click modular router, which I think is a great project, you know, Eddie Kohler's work, um, where in that case he's trying to modularize data plane processing. Here we're trying to modularize control plane processing. But same basic idea. We'd like people to have a rich set of modules they can just grab. And if they need to do something special, they just focus on the one thing they need to do and have a, a rich developer community around them where they can get the rest of the software from. Very nice. So um, you mentioned you know, these, these, these two aspects, one is sort of a grand unification of, of, of function, if you will, and the other is sort of a high-level programming abstractions. Um, mm -hmm. 
And uh, I guess that brings me to my, my next thought, which is that um, certainly a lot of the programming languages for, for SDN, arguably Frenetic included, really mm -hmm. still, still deal a lot with uh, kind of packet forwarding operations, um, you know, things that routers and switches typically do. Uh, right. But there's, there seems to be like an increasing um, emergence or, or at least attention to, I guess they're already there, these uh, middle boxes, right? And it seems right. like by some counts, networks have more middle boxes than, than routers and switches. Um, and it's like each one of those has some vendor-specific low-level function and configuration. And do you think that um, SDN has the answer to that kind of uh, uh, divergence that we're seeing in the middle box space? And, and also, if so, what do you think the role is for existing programming languages like Frenetic in, in that kind of area? Yeah, that's a great question. I think in many settings, the like you said, the switches are just one part and arguably even a small part of the problem. I think the reason SDN focused there first is for, for many people, particularly in, in data centers, the network is, the, is in the way in the most profound way. It's the one part of the system that someone that's writing, writing, running a large data center isn't allowed to program. It's fragile, hard to configure, and they're not allowed to change it. And these are people that write code all the time and are really annoyed that that their network equipment is somehow performs the least well, is the most expensive, and is the one thing they can't code. And so I think it's natural SDN started there, but if that's where it stops, then it's, it's not really good enough because the end host is a big part of the problem in the data center, and middle boxes in any kind of network setting are, are a huge one. And, and you're already seeing a sort of disaggregation of network appliances like middle, middle boxes for things like firewalling, load balancing, intrusion detection, uh, separate, separating the hardware that those appliances run on today from the software that, that actually runs on that hardware so that you could run a middle box as just a virtual machine that can be loaded on any general purpose x86 box that might be inside your data center or your enterprise. And so at a minimum, a role SDN has to play there is traffic steering to be able to, to place those VMs where you want them mm -hmm. and to be able to decide which subset of traffic goes through which sequence of those boxes. And so in that case, you could view SDN as just kind of glorified plumbing. I think the more polite word is orchestration. Uh, but it, it really is plumbing, and that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. It gets more interesting if I, mean, I think that's interesting in its own right, because now you essentially have an elastic network where you can just view your right. pool of switches and your pool of servers as just a platform on which you can decide what functionality to run where and how to get the traffic to and fro. It gets even more interesting if you think, well, gee, how do I program a middle box in the first place? Do I just view it as a black box VM that I slap on a server, or do I have a way of programming that kind of functionality that's more sophisticated than the packet processing OpenFlow switches can do. And I think that's a very, very exciting area. And I, I'd certainly not something Frenetic has bitten off yet, but I think it'd be very interesting to think about how do you write more sophisticated packet processing functionality that goes deeper into the packets, that might reassemble the packets into, into mm -hmm. flow, into connections, that mm -hmm. might do things like encryption or compression or actions that are much more sophisticated than drop or forward. And I don't think we necessarily want to make switches that are all singing and all dancing that do all these things. So we'll probably have a heterogeneous mix of devices in the network that can be purposed in different ways to, to do those functions. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, the the, the sort of common pool of resources, as you describe it, it's it, I've, I've noticed that it's that it's a, that's a common description for virtual networks as well. Like you just sort of view the view the the network as this pool of resources from which you can pull. And um, it right. seems to me that like. With with the middle box function types of things that we're that we're talking about, that some of the um, you know one way to view it is you just have a bunch of virtual machines that you could sort of instantiate all over the place, and you have SDN or an SDN controller orchestrate those. Right. But then also there may be some specialized hardware like crypto accelerators or Definitely. you know hardware transcoders or FPGA based forwarding or network processors and. Um, it seems to me like there's a real challenge there to try to figure out how to how to use SDN to, to, to make the most of, of what's there. Yeah, I think that's fair. So I think there's two views on that. One is that um, the heterogeneity will always be there because there's there are naturally some devices that are better than some things than others. So we might have GPUs or FPGAs or a mix of different different uh, things that can do deep packet inspection. Another view, sort of con contrary to that, is that the commodity compute platforms are getting pretty darn good. And if you have a good right. network interface card and a big multi-core system, that maybe you'll you know that'll actually be quite competitive with custom hardware or yeah. semi-custom hardware. And I actually don't really know what I think about that. I mean, I think if you look at at least today's platforms, there's a big cost and power gap to using custom, some specialized hardware if that hardware itself is also commoditized. Mm 
now using a merchant silicon chipset to build a switch packet processor for example it's still cheaper and lower power than doing that same processing in software but the gap may narrow especially as you know a software switch is not really software everything has hardware right so as the commodity absolutely. server absolutely. as the commodity server platforms get better in their ability to do packet processing better NICs, better offload from the NIC directly into user space better TCP segmentation support directly in the NIC. We may find that the software platforms, commodity software platforms, become more competitive and we don't need all this heterogeneity. And I think that's a debate that's playing out right now. And I actually, I'm very puzzled about it myself. I'm not exactly sure where I think the, the where things are going to land. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see, to see what happens there, definitely. Um, I had a specific question about about uh, the frenetic project actually and, and yeah. I think probably some of the students um, taking the course probably also have, have similar que uh, question which is that uh, frenetic seems to have different parts like there's uh, there's the frenetic language in that's that's OCaml based and then there's pyretic which is which is Python based and in the course we're, we're gonna have people definitely look at pyretic just because it's it's built on pox um, but mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you could just say a few words about um, each of them, sort of, you know, what they do, um, you know, what what the differences are, if if and and what kind of in, you know what kind of distinctions people should be aware of. Yeah, so they both share a common philosophy of sort of programming languages meets networking and trying to identify uh, powerful reusable abstractions for programming the network, and 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 that's embodied in this underlying language called NetCore which you could think of as, as, a, as a level of abstraction above what an open flow switch does. Instead of bit patterns in the packet header, we have predicate, Boolean predicates that you can use to match on packets. And actions that are sort of similar in spirit to, to what OpenFlow provides, but a more abstract view that a policy for a network is a, is a function from a packet and its location to another packet or set of packets in their locations. And so it gives you a little bit more abstract way to specify a policy and to combine policies together. So both Pyretic and Frenetic's OCaml code base share that underlying NetCore language that we think is actually a very powerful one. Um, the, then the two diverge a bit. And, that, and they differ um, for, for two reasons. One is uh, there, we have a lot of interest in this large multi-institution project in, first of all, having uh, language abstractions that are useful to systems programmers, as well as being able to do research on compiler and verification technology. And so the Frenetic OCaml code base is written in a functional language. Um, a lot of the code in the OCaml code base has uh, been auto-generated using a theorem prover, so we can actually prove that the underlying runtime system works correctly. This is work that Nate Foster and, and uh, Arjun Guha and others at Cornell have done. And, and so that work um, is, has a lot of focus on much more sophisticated compiler and verification technology. Hmm. And uh, the, the la surface language it presents to programmers is OCaml, which even though it's a little less familiar to the systems community, is still a very friendly language for systems programming. Um, and in fact, it's used in, in uh, Ericsson quite heavily and some other companies as well. Uh, um, absolutely. I, I, I taught it once. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the Pyretic code base is, is based in Python, which uh, I think broadens its ability to be used by a, a lot of programmers who are more comfortable in Python than they might be in imperative languages yes. in general. And it has more sophisticated support for topology abstraction so that you can write your programs okay. on an abstract view of the network topologies. You could treat a whole bunch of switches as one big switch if you want to be able to define access control. Or you might treat one physical switch as multiple virtual switches that have one foot in each island of, let's say, an Ethernet subnet and an IP subnet where you could write a program that says, I am a gateway, I connect to an Ethernet island, an IP island, and I do ARP and forwarding. And so you can write your programs in a way that take advantage of these topology abstractions. But its underlying runtime system, at least today, is not as sophisticated as in the other code base. And so the two, the two languages sort of are, I wouldn't say one's better than the other, they just have somewhat more uh, different focus on, on um, different programs, slightly different emphasis on programming abstractions and different levels of maturity in their, their current compiler technology. That's sort of natural. We're we're playing around. I think SDN's a pretty young young field, and like everyone else, we're experimenting with a lot of a lot of different ideas. And that's sort of where our state of experimentation, if you will, is at this point. Yeah, that's that's really exciting. So um, I guess that that leads me, I guess, to to my last question, which is, um, you know, you know, has to do with excitement, right? Like, so let's say that um, you know, I'm excited. Let's... Yeah, <laughs> me too. <Okay. laughs> So, um, so let's let's say that a that a, a student walks into your office and, and says, uh, you know, uh, Jen, I want I want to really program something with with frenetic or pyretic. Um, give me something to do. Um, 
what, what would you what would you suggest in terms of you know what, what should they play around with or what, what do you think the, the you know what problem would you give them to, to sort of go go work on? Um, well, I think there's two things: get their hands dirty, or or in terms of like the 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 sort of big problem that keeps you that, that you'd love to see solved with pyretic or frenetic. Yeah, so I think if the, if the idea is to come up the learning curve, I would do what I think you're you're already doing in your course, which is to build up a couple of small different modules and then combine them together, because that's what what shows you the the power of having the higher level composition operators, and uh, you know build a firewall and a switch and a load balancer and a monitor and and realize that you know each of them are not that complicated in their own right, and snapping them together isn't so complicated. But if you tried to write write one piece of code that did all of that, all of a sudden it would get gory and complicated in completely uninteresting and tedious ways. And that that would be a useful exercise just to see that the abstractions we've got seem to be right, at least for for one piece of what's important in SDN programming. But as far as what to do next, I think um, there's been a lot of work on data centers in the SDN space, and there's still, I'm sure, plenty of interesting things to do there. The middle box question you asked about earlier being a, a great example. But I would pick a topic like, how do I integrate SDN with the end host? How do I use SDN in a cellular core network or in a radio access network or an internet exchange point? Uh, in some like in some of the work you've, you and I've been doing together, you know, to pick a domain or, or transit networks that is not yet using SDN, and to figure out what's the pain that people have in managing those networks today, and and how can we actually reduce that pain? I mean, all of this is about lowering the barrier to innovation and making network management simpler and more reliable and more flexible. And nothing beats actually working with people that are running real networks to figure out where their pain is. Yeah, that's that's super great advice uh, as always. So, um, yeah, this has been fun. Um, I uh, I uh, look forward to to continuing to work with you and also uh, to seeing what comes next out of these projects. Um, I was really excited to see Frenetic and Pyretic come out myself, and and a lot of my students are are using them already. So um, this is really cool, and and thanks very much for the time. My pleasure. <laughs>